All right. Good morning. Okay, so this. All right. So it's the last day of class, right? Today. Oh. <laughs> yes. Um, let's see. We we have a review session, right? December 16, which actually tomorrow, uh, from 2 to 3, room 153. So if you guys have questions, want to ask me, and you can come to the review session tomorrow. Um, and we have, uh, again, a two-day for finals, right? Alternative on December 17th at 9.30 in the same classroom here. And the other, the regular final uh, date still 23rd. Can't remember what time? Afternoon, right? On the 23rd, 8 to 10. Yeah. 10? 10? 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8 to 10. 23rd. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, and some of you are asking me a question about the final, uh, you know, how much the older stuff will be, on uh, how you guys will need to focus on. And I already sent, sent you guys email, but just wanted to clarify again, and for the older material, like 30% of, uh, you know, uh, carbohydrate and lipid metabol metabolism only, question? How many total questions are there? Oh, total question 80, right? And 70% of the question focusing on the new materials and 30% on the older. But older, we're only focusing on the carbohydrate and lipid metabolism part, right? And just try to focus on the study guide question for the older 30% of, you know, um, old materials, right? And I think it should be not that, not that hard, right? I mean. All right. Um, so today we're going to finish up the exercise, a few realization exercise, and the uh, the last uh, session is called glycemic index and and dietary effect on the metabolism. So we um, stop here. I remember, right? Stop here last um, class. Um, so this slide just tell us uh, four different things actually make a comparison between chain and unchain and how they uh, utilize the, you know, fuels, um, particularly carbohydrate and fat differently. The first thing is that the overall oxygen uptake or consumption is lower in the unchained, right? So the y-axis represents, I believe, the um, oxygen uptake, right? And so you see that overall, the unchained individuals usually um, take up less oxygen. So that is a problem that they have a lower oxidative capacity, right? They have, they have, have a, um, so utilize, okay, let me see. So all this, these four um, things that I listed here is related to unchained individuals compared to chain, right? So unchained individuals have uh, overall have a lower um, oxygen uptake, oxygen consumption rate, um, and they also utilize more carbohydrate um, and less fat, right? If you compare to here, the 75% um, of energy actually is from the carbohydrate, only 25% of energy from fat in the unchained. And if you compare to chain, they almost like a 50-50, right? They utilize 50% carbohydrate and 50% fat, right? So unchained individuals utilize less um, fat, only 25% you know, of fat versus 55% of fat in the chain individuals, right? And the third thing is the fat utilization capacity or oxidative capacity is small in the unenchained compared to the chain, right? Because of the lower oxygen consumption, right? They are not able to uptake the, their, you know, cardiovascular system 
right? Um, we not allow them to take more oxygen, so they have a low oxygen consumption, so that's why they have a lower, um, you know, um, fat utilization capacity. And last thing is the more glucose is, is partially oxidized to generally lactate in the unchanged because they have uh, more um, type 2x fibers are recruited, right? So try to remember these four different, different characteristics uh, in terms of uh, fuel utilization and metabolism in unchained uh, individuals can, as compared to uh, chained um, individuals. Um, and here, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the fuel utilization uh, between chain, uh, chain, chaining, before chaining, after chaining. So how chain, chaining can uh, change the fuel utilization, right? Um, so the total energy uh, utilization is not different between before and after, right, chaining. Um, but before chaining, um, usually the um, utilize more um, carbohydrate, right? Let me see. Can you see actually? Oh, okay. So the middle panel uh, represents the energy um, energy uh, from the fat, right? So you see the um, after chaining the solid dot represent after chaining and um, so you compare to before chaining the after chaining they utilize more fat right after chaining the, the body are able to utilize more fat <coughs> and the top panel is the um, carbohydrate utilization right the energy from carbohydrate so um, before chaining um, they utilize more in the body utilize more carbohydrate. After chaining, the body are able to utilize more fat, right? So again, the after chaining, um, the fat utilization is increased, or fat utilization capacity is increased to allow the body to utilize more um, fat. Um, okay, so post-exercise recovery period, you know, when finish the uh, exercise or finish the uh, games or competition, uh, what happens in the body after exercise? First thing is the muscle glycogen is, is, is depleted, right? This is the most significant thing after, uh, after exercise, right? You almost utilize, you utilize all the gly uh, glycogen in the scared muscle. So muscle glycogen uh, depression is the most in, important thing after, um, or significant things after um, exercise. Um, and glucose and fatty acids can be uptaken by muscle and utilized, right? So in a lot of fatty acids is also being utilized to glucose. Um, so insulin sensitivity in skeletal muscle is increased. Um, and the major source of fuel um, for the body during the first 18 hours of recovery period, uh, even, you know, we're giving the um, uh, individuals a high carbohydrate diet. What do you expect the, you know, the major source of fuel during the um, post-exercise um, period? Fatty acids, yes. Why? Right, right. So because of the glycogen is almost depleted, right? So actually, the body um, shut off the, um, you know, the, um, the carbohydrate. So at this post-exercise um, period, its most important thing is to rebuild glycogen to resynthesize glycogen, re rebuild glycogen. So that means that it, then we need to give them a high carbohydrate diet. But for the adaptation, for the physiological response of the body, um, even we give them a high carbohydrate diet, but the but body actually utilizes, preferentially utilizes fat. 
the reason is try to save the, the glucose for uh, re-synthesis or for, for rebuild the um, uh, glycogen, muscle glycogen, right? Does that make sense? Right? So try to remember, and after, you know, the post-exercise uh, recovery period, body preferentially utilize carbohydrate, uh, sorry, uh, fat um, as the energy source. The purpose of this is to save the, the glucose for synthesis, for resynthesis of glycogen, the rebuild glycogen, right? So most important thing is to rebuild glycogen after uh, exercise. Um, and of course, the um, muscle intracellular um, muscular triglyceride also need to be uh, restored. But this will happen within the 48 hours recovery, right? Right? Um, OK, so now we finish the aerobic metabolism, right? When we give the example of aerobic metabolism in the marathon, and you know what kind of fuels to utilize during the um, marathon running, and you know fuel utilization switch, and post uh, exercise period we need to um, rebuild muscle glycogen, right? To to give them a high carbohydrate diet, but body uh, usually use the fat to uh, for energy during the post exercise uh, period. Um, now um, let's talk about an anaerobic metabolism. So the main characteristic of this type of metabolism is that it requires a, ro a lot of energy right, in a very short period of time. For example, the uh, uh, anaerobic metabolism, a good example is a 100 meter sprinting exercise. Um, so this, and because of uh, oxygen, it's not able to be delivered to the to, to a skin muscle during this 10 seconds, right, during this short period of time. So the ATP production will not um, be generated from aerobic metabolism, right, because of the timing, right, too short, you know. The, um, um, so that means the uh, ATP is produced primarily from the anaerobic metabolism because of uh, that reason. Um, so how is ATP is, is produced during the anaerobic metabolism for immediate use? We, we talked about it earlier, right? You know, for anaerobic metabolism, what is a major source of energy, uh, energy fuse for ATP production? Glycolysis, yeah, glycolysis pathway, but energy fuse, you know, energy fuse, um, fat, carbohydrate, or something else. Carbohydrate, right? So carbohydrate should be the um, important sources of the um, energies during the aerobic metabolism. Um, and other thing is important, usually use intramuscular fuels, meaning that the carbohydrate only is already present in the in, inside of a scalp muscle, right, or uh, cells. So that should be easily or quickly, you know, break down and and oxidize it. Um, for for example, liver glycogen. What do you think a liver glycogen would be important? Fuels for the. It's not right. It takes time to break down liver glycogen to release glucose and then transport it to, to the skin muscle. It takes time, will not happen during 10 seconds, right? So liver glycogen is not the important energy fuel for the muscle for anaerobic exercise. Um, so intramuscular glucose stores, which I just mentioned, and then muscle glycogen, right? And the creatine phosphate. Remember, creatine phosphate. Creatine phosphate is also very important energy fuse for anaerobic muscle exercise, right? And glucose is usually um, is anaerobically metabolized, right? Through the glycolysis pathway and also. Uh, 
and just go to the partial oxidation and generate lactate. So anaerobic exercise usually can very easily produce the um, lactate because of this uh, you know, metabolic characteristics, right? anaerobic metabolism. So again, utilize the, the two intramuscular uh, fuels, creating phosphate and the muscle glycogen. Right? These are the two uh, important or main uh, energy fuels that are utilized by uh, muscle during anaerobic exercise. So here are a couple of questions that I've already mentioned. Right? The, uh, is fat the main fuels for ATP production during anaerobic exercise? It's definitely not, right? Fat utilization requires oxygen, and this we mentioned the main reason that um, this type of exercise and is anaerobic because of uh, you know the time timing is so quick happening and oxygen is not um, you know enough time to be delivered to to the to the muscle. A second question: Does liver glycogen store affect ATP production in anaerobic exercise? Not right. We also explain, and it's also take it needs time to to do uh, to make this happen. Um, and the third question: Does muscle glycogen store affect ATP production in anaerobic exercise? Yes, of course. Right. This is a muscle glycogen is a major uh, energy fuse for anaerobic exercise. Um, and does creating phosphate levels in muscle affect ATP production in anaerobic exercise? Yes, right. So only muscle glycogen and creating phosphate levels that affect the ATP production in anaerobic exercise, right? So for this, um, you know, sprinting runners, uh, you wanted to um, have them to, to store more glycogen or to have a more uh, creating phosphate in, 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 in the muscle. All right, more about the sources of carbohydrate and or the energy fuse during anaerobic exercise. We know that create, creating phosphate is one of the important energy fuels and glucose, particularly the muscle glycogen from muscle glycogen breakdown, right? And but of course, the uh, blood glucose is also um, serve as energy fuse for um, you know anaerobic exercise because it it, it should be easy, it should be quick enough to pick up glucose from circulation right? and and directly oxidize. So. And so creating phosphate um, is used for the first few seconds during the exercise because it is compared to the, to break, break, break down the glycogen and oxidize of glucose. And the creating phosphate seems to be more um, quickly, right? You know, being, um, um, being metabolized and produce energies. For example, just the one reaction the cre uh, creating phosphate can be um, be phosphorylated by creating kinase and produce ATP, right? So this is just one reaction, and you can get ATP made. So this is very quick uh, process. So that's why the cre creating um, phosphate is the energy source for the first few seconds. So just talk about a little bit more um, the um, creatine, how creatine is made, synthesized in the body, and also from the food, right? Um, but just in general, um, cre creatine phosphate can be made from the amino acids, the arginine, right? So arginine and glycine are the two important amino acids that I used for synthesis of um, creating phosphate. Right? So creating once is made in the liver and pancreas and kidney and then transported to the scrap muscle and converted to uh, being 
get phosphorylated to create, creating phosphate and store in the scalp muscle, right? So again, the cre creatine made from glycogen, uh, um, arginase and the glycine in the liver, kidney, and pancreas, and then transported to the scalp muscle and get phosphorylated to um, create phosphate and store in the scalp muscle for energy use, right? Um, and also s food sources. So many food, particularly, you know, the salmon, tuna, beef, also contain some cravings, right? So if you eat this type of food, you also get creatine from, from the food, from the diet. Um, so this slide tell us the, um, you know, this two major fields, creatine phosphate and glycogen um, use, utili utilization uh, during this 10 second um, exercise, right? So see the first few seconds, um, you immediately, uh, you get ATPs from creating phosphate, right? And uh, after a few minutes, a few seconds later, then the glycogen will become most important the energy source, right, during this 10 seconds. The reason I already mentioned just uh, um, the, the, the matter of time, right? I mean, creating phosphate is very easy, uh, quick, quickly to um, be um, metabolized and produce ATPs, and glycogen breakdown and, uh, uh, and metabolize, the glucose metabolized to produ produce ATP, that takes a little bit longer time, right, as compared to just the one, uh, one step, I mean, one reaction you know, from the cre creatine phosphate. Um, and this is just the, um, the process or met 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 metabolic pathways for glucose um, being utilized as an energy during this 10 second, the anaerobic exercise, basically just go partial oxidation, glycolysis, right? Partial oxidation, partial glycolysis to lactate, and all right. So now let's move to the um, scalp muscle adaptation in response to training. So what a kind of uh, you know the adaptation that our body uh, needs to do in order to um, get better. Um, oxidation capacity, right, to be, be able to uh, oxide more fat um, and, the, uh, and also increase the muscle glycogen um, content. So training, we all know, right, can improve, you know, the endurance. Um, so these are the three aspects of the adaptation in response to training. So first of all is the cardiovascular adaptation, right? And this adaptation, the purpose of cardiovascular ad adaptation is to increase the oxygen, right, uptake and oxygen delivery to muscle um, and to uh, increase oxidative capacity. So increase the cardio cardiac output, increase gas exchange in the lungs, right, and also increase capillary density in the scalp muscle to allow the more blood um, stream, right, flow into the uh, scalp muscle. And all, all these three uh, things in our body uh, does is to increase oxygen delivery, right, oxygen uptake and delivery to the uh, scalp muscle. And the second aspect of adaptation is to increase mitochondrial number per unit ma mass of muscle, right? We only have um, oxygen is not enough, right? We also need mitochondria, more mitochondria to do the um, ox oxidation, right? Oxidative process. So mitochondria number is also important and also uh, in increase. And this increase will increase beta oxidation process and increase the reliance on um, um, fat utilization, right, or increase uh, fat oxidation uh, capacity, um, and the less um, rely, um, to decrease the re reliance on the carbohydrate utilization, right. Uh, if we can utilize more fat, then we 
less rely on the carbohydrate store, right? The glycogen store. So um, decrease the, um, the reliance on the carbohydrate utilization, then will decrease lactate production. So lactate is the is the cost of the lactate acid accumulation is the cost of the fatigue, right? So if we can reduce the lactate production, then can reduce the fatigue, you know. So that will um, definitely will in, improve the um, you know endurance. And, and last thing is to increase muscle glycogen. Okay, now carbohydrate loading, diet and exercise. And uh, remember the carbohydrate. We 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 um, notice that the uh, we know that the uh, carbohydrate uh, the store like muscle glycogen store is, is also important, right? A factory you know performance. Reason is because in the and the uh, during the later stage of exercise, particularly from mod modulate to High intensity of exercise, the fat utilization decrease, right, and have more rely on the carbohydrate and metabolism and carbohydrate stores. Uh, so, if we can increase um, glycogen stores, then we also can uh, and can improve, particularly in the you know in the very last stage of a uh, of a competition. I can. <coughs> improve the uh, ATP production, right, energy production. So the carbohydrate loading means the increase the, um, the uh, you know, the carbo sources of carbohydrate for energy, that's very important. Um, so the, the most efficient way to uh, increase carbohydrate loading is, is just give them a High carbohydrate diet, right? To allow them to eat more carbohydrate. Um, and this will be the um, will be more important, particularly you know after um, exercise, right? Recovery period time. Um, Oh, the question here: Can a high-fat um, diet help to build up muscle glycogen? If we don't give them a carbohydrate, high carbohydrate diet, just a regular, you know, uh, carb carbohydrate diet, and I just try to give them more fat, yes. I had a question. If you want to finish your thought. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, mm -hmm. On the skeletal muscle adaptation slide. Right. Um, were those resulting from anaerobic or aerobic or just all exercise? Oh, that's specific? that's a great question. I think mostly as refers to aerobic exercise, right? The long term exercise. Because anaerobic exercise does not require oxygen, right? I mean so for anaerobic exercise I think the the glycogen and uh, uh, creating phosphate are most important if we wanted to increase, you know, um, the muscle store of these two important fields. Great question. Um, so what about this question? Carbohydrate diet can help. Yes. Mm. Well, that probably have a limited source, right? So, so I don't think that is uh, played a major role you know, in the restoring uh, glycogen, right? So it's actually no. The the answer is no. I think uh, we have actually um, scientific evidence to prove this, right? In the next couple slide, you know, we just make a comparison. If we just give them high fat diet compared to a regular um, diet or high carbohydrate diet and see which type of diet and make them to store more glycogen, right? So here's a, you know, the study, the research study um, was actually 
conduct it in 1967, and they just wanted to know how much carbohydrate uh, are needed to, um, you know, to increase the glycogen stores. So they um, divided like three groups, right, and gave them a different type of diet. High fat diet, which contained the um, fat, um, 80% contribute total energy, um, and the normal diet, 50 contained 55% of, of carbohydrate, um, and high carbohydrate diet, 82% you know, of a energy actually from carbohydrate. So, uh, and they give this three different diets to three group of uh, um, people, and fed them for three days, right, before the exercise test. And then they measure the glycogen store and the, uh, the time to exhaustion, right? So if you um, don't have enough ATPs, then they're easy to get exhaust, right? Um, so here's the results. Um, X axis represents the how much glycogen, right, you know, as a gram um, that each group they, they have. And the Y axis represents the time to exhaustion, how easy it is to get exhausted, right, during exercise. So black bar is the high fat diet group, and yellow, uh, sorry, red is the normal diet, and, uh, and uh, green, the high carbohydrate diet. So in terms of the uh, energy, I'm uh, sorry, the uh, muscle glycogen stores, you see the normal diet um, can store about a 200 gram of glycogen in scalp muscle, right? And high fat diet group, see, actually have less, only uh, stored 100 gram of glycogen. And high carbohydrate diet group is able to store about 40 400 gram of uh, um, muscle glycogen. So this result is, is very clear, right? Tell us the high carbohydrate diet is most important diet, you know, that can increase the muscle glycogen stores, right? And high fat diet actually decreases the muscle glycogen stores, right? It's compared to normal diet. And for the time for exhaustion, and if you have a more glycogen store, then you have a longer time to get exhausted, right? And, you know, and less uh, glycogen in the high fat diet group, it's very easy uh, to get exhausted, right? So this study, again, just tell us, you know, carbohydrate diet is the most efficient way to, uh, to, to increase the muscle glycogen store or for carbohydrate loading, right? Is it only in individuals? Um, that's a good question. I'm not quite a sure, probably just uh, um, on chain, chain. I'm not sure they, uh, there was a chain on chain. Probably we'll have, I guess we'll have, have a similar result, right? First, you know, if we do on the chain or on chain, um, Okay, so um, the approach, how can we um, load a carbohydrate diet or a car carbohydrate or increase muscle glycogen? There are actually, uh, I'm going to talk about three approaches, right? And the first approach um, is to give them a carbohydrate um, diet before competition. For example, um, we can, um, you know, give the three, one to three days of rest um, or reduce exercise training, right? And then you give the uh, high carbohydrate diet, right? Um, so this is one approach. Um, you can give them, um, you know, carbohydrate diet before competition. And Approach two is give the carbohydrate meal um, just a couple, 
sorry, the first first approach actually the several days before competition, right? Give a carbohydrate diet, and the second approach is give carbohydrate diet just a couple hours um, before competition. Uh, for example, um, you know, two to four hours. So if competition uh, takes less than two hours, and you can just give them a digestible food product or spot drinks, right? So be able to um, you know, digest and absorb the carbohydrate into the uh, body. And if the, um, if the competition is, is takes longer time, is longer than two hours, and we, we can uh, consider to give the solid product, for example, bread, bananas, or energy bars, because you have, they have a time to digest and absorb, right? So, sorry, I, I probably kind of confused again myself. I just wanted to repeat again. So, for the second approach, if the competition is less than two hours, and we wanted to give something, you know, digestible, I, I quickly, you know, be digest and absorb this um, product, right? And or spot G, uh, spot genes. And if the competition takes longer time, longer than two hours or four hours, and then you you can. And the solid product is okay, right? They have time to, to you know, digest and absorb the uh, glucose into the circulation. Um, and the last approach, and um, give them a carbohydrate drinks just during the competition. For example, cycling and running, or marathon running exercise. Um, then you can give them, um, you know, spot drink. So, because this uh, glucose should be very, uh, the spot drink usually contains a lot of glucose, right? So it should be very quickly, you know, uh, uh, absorbed uh, into the body. So, um, and the other type of uh, intermittent high intensity sports, for example, uh, some low intensity exercise uh, combined with the repeated short distance sprinting, this type of exercise, for example, soccer and I'm not sure, but football maybe you can also consider this type of exercise. And, and you can also give them a um, carbohydrate containing genes uh, or, um, you know, to store, to help them to, um, um, uh, to save some uh, muscle glycogen for the last, um, you know, few minutes of the uh, sprinting, at the end of the games, right? All right, any questions about the, uh, all this exercise? Okay, so now we finished the exercise and we wanted to move on the, um, the last session, glycolysis index and diet effect on metabolism, right? Um, Okay, so what is a, gly a glycemic index? So glycemic index is the ranking system for carbohydrates and based on their like how quickly they can be absorbed into the body, into the circulation, how quickly they affect the blood glucose level, right? So the um, glycemic index. So GI uh, is a percentage value represents the area under the um, blood glucose response curve. Uh, we're going to talk about the area, the area under the curve in the next slide, right? Um, so that, that means how we calculated the GI. Um, so GI usually is measured at the uh, defined inter intervals over a period of uh, two hours. I right? mean that when we give them a, a individuals a, um, a, a certain amount of a glucose, and then we measure the blood glucose level and to, uh, during the two hours after you know, giving the uh, glucose and see how quickly um, it, this um, you know, meal or whatever test food will increase the blood glucose level. And usually we use the uh, standard food as the um, as sort of reference, uh, usually um, white bread or just the glucose we as the uh, standard food. Right? 
so here the how um, the uh, you know the group I mean how does the GI being tested so again and at the beginning if you give a food or standard food uh, or glucose usually um, that food or glucose contains 50 grams of uh, carbohydrate right and, and then you measure the glucose every 15 minutes and during the next two hours period right and so you can see and so you have a sort of uh, under, uh, area under the curve, right? And then you calculate the you know, area under the curve. So if you compare high, glyc high glycemic index food versus low glycemic index food, you see the how um, bigger response um, in, you know, to the uh, glucose or to the food in terms of the uh, blood glucose levels, right? For example, the low glycemic index, you have you increase the glucose, but the level is as relative low as compared to high glycemic index food, right? So high gl glycemic index food is more quickly and uh, increase blood glucose level and more significantly, right? And uh, compared to low glycemic index food. And here is the uh, equation for calculation of GI. So GI glycemic index usually is calculated by the uh, area under the curve, usually two hours in the measurement, right, uh, of the uh, tested food and divided by area under the curve of a standard food. Standard food, again, we usually use a bread, a white bread or just uh, a uh, glucose solution, right, and times 100. So area under the curve, we already, I already explained right in the last uh, the, uh, slide. All right, so the uh, testing food, uh, you also need to um, make sure that this food contains the fixed uh, amount of uh, carbohydrate, which is uh, uh, 50 gram, right, to make sure that, you know, testing food also contain the 50 gram of a carbohydrate. Um, so glycemic index of food have uh, three different levels, the low, medium, and high glycemic index. And so for low, uh, the, if the value is 55 or less, consider low glycemic index, right? Um, and medium is 56 to 69, uh, high is um, 70 or more than 70. Um, and each category, uh, you have, uh, you know, represent like food, different type food, maybe around to the low glycemic index food or high glycemic index food. For example, the most fruit are vegetables and you would consider a whole grains are considered the low glycemic index food um, and corn flakes or uh, um, bake, baked potatoes and some um, white rice or white bread is considered the, um, it belongs to the high glycemic index food, right? Um, so the low glycemic index food usually release the glucose and more slowly, right, and, and, and steadily and, and causing the less or lower uh, increase the blood glucose levels, right? And high glycemic index food is just go opposite, you know, very quickly increase blood glucose level and increase a little bit higher um, blood, uh, glucose levels compared to uh, low glycemic index food. Um, and the two things you may want to um, remember, the, in terms of a high glycemic index food, um, high glycemic index food is suitable for energy recovery of endurance exercise because it's the, uh, you know, have a high, um, the glucose, right? Sorry, the glucose is, is, is quickly, you know, can be absorbed and into the circulation. And second thing is, is the high glycemic index also suitable for person with diabetes and experience hypoglycemia 
So that diabetes patients, if they experience hypoglycemia, they need glucose e immediately, right, quickly. So the high glycemic, so we need to consider high glycemic index food um, for the, um, you know, diabetic patient for hyper experience hyperglycemia. Uh, all right, so let's take 10 minutes break.
Okay, let's uh, finish up the um, rest of the session. So um, let's see here. Yeah, I think we finished this slide about glycemic index food and high glycemic index food is suitable for um, exercise, right, after, you know, exercise recovery um, and also uh, is um, suitable for um, diabetes. Diabetes experience hyperglycemia. Um, now let's talk about the simple versus complex carbohydrate. So complex carbohydrate food, for example, whole grains, um, you know, the, the whole grain breads, all the other brown rice and stuff, and it's considered a complex carbohydrate. Um, and so complex carbohydrates break down into glucose more slowly than simple carbohydrate, right? It's, it should be easy to understand because, uh, you know, the, the structure is uh, more complex and you need time to digest the um, complex carbohydrate, so it takes longer time. Um, so, so you probably already heard about a lot of, lot, right, about the, you know, health beneficial, the uh, complex carbohydrate, like particularly whole grain um, stuff. So um, because it's, again, it's, um, you know, um, complex and digestion takes longer time. So the, usually the co complex carbohydrate that pro provide a gradual, steady uh, stream of blood, uh, glucose throughout the day. That means, you know, you increase the blood glucose level very slowly and, and, and not significantly and can avoid a sharp increase in the blood glucose levels, right? Will not, uh, uh, compact carbohydrate will not uh, sh increase the uh, blood glucose sharply, I mean, significantly. Um, so natural um, carbohydrate or uh, compact carbohydrate usually is a better choice, right? For, uh, uh, you know, for weight loss. Um, and one thing that I wanted to uh, point out that the dietary fibers uh, usually contribute little to the post grandule um, blood glucose levels, right? Um, but they have actually very good you know, beneficial effect and in terms of a rolling um, glycemic response or rolling blood glucose levels. So dietary fibers is is good thing, right? The itself doesn't contribute much to the blood glucose level, right? Um, but they have a actually beneficial effect. Um, and a second concept that I wanted to introduce um, in the is the glycemic load. So if we only know the glycemic index is not enough to um, estimate or to assess the and the effect of a carbohydrate, I mean the food, you know, uh, on the blood glucose control. Mm. So, for example, uh, glycemic index only tells you and how rap rapidly a particular carbohydrate and diet turns into glucose in the circulation, right? Just how rapidly. Um, but the GL glycemic load value actually um, considering the how much carbohydrate a serving of the food contains, you know, the, the condense of the um, carbohydrate in particular food, right? So the glycemic load is related to the uh, total amount of uh, carbohydrate uh, in the particular food, right? So you're not only thinking about um, the, okay, let's put it that way. So a glycemic index more related to the complexity of a carbohydrate, right? Or type of a carbohydrate in the particular food. And glycemic load is more related to the total amount of carbohydrate in the food, regardless simple or 
uh, complex carbohydrate, right? Does that make sense? So we need to consider both um, glycemic index and glycemic load in order to evaluate the, um, the health benefits um, or metabolic effect of, the, um, of, of, of certain diets. Um, so how glycemic load is calculated? So here's the equation. The glycemic load is the glycemic index divided by 100 and times available carbohydrate content in grams, in particular food. Right? Um, and we need to, uh, in terms of carbohydrate content, we need to minus fibers. Why we need to min minus fibers from the uh, carbohydrate when we remember? Yeah, it's not digestible and not when you know doesn't contribute to the blood uh, blood glucose level, right? So we need to minus fibers um, when we calculate the um, glycemic load. Load. So glycemic load also have uh, three different categories. The low uh, GL, uh, we usually less than 10, and medium and GL uh, uh, between 11 and 19, and high GL usually. Um, higher than 20. So here I put the two things, uh, things together, the glycemic index and the glycemic load um, and, and a different food. This uh, sometimes is not straightforward, the relationship between uh, GI and GL and a high GI not necessarily have a high GL, right? It's not, you know, really correlated. Um, I just take example, for example, watermelon. Watermelon is considered a high glycemic index because the um, type of carbohydrate in watermelon probably uh, relatively simple. So, you know, when you eat watermelon, the, the, carbo the glucose or carbohydrate in the watermelon very easily to be absorbed and, and you know, uh, into the circulation. So they have, so watermelon has, has a high GI but if but the um, but if you compare to ice cream, um, which has lower GI, you know, thir uh, uh, thirty-seven versus seventy-two. Um, but if you consider its serving size, if you know, consider GL because of um, serving size, and for example, what melon is 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 higher, right, than the uh, the uh, ice cream, a hundred. 20 gram versus 50 gram, and both um, mean the carbohydrate available in the particular serving of the watermelon and ice cream are different. Um, so for example, 120 gram of watermelon contains 6 gram carbohydrate, and 50 gram of ice cream contains 9 um, gram of carbohydrate. So and it turns out these two um, type of food have a similar, have a actually the same GL, right, and four. Um, and if you, let's take another example, let's see the um, mashed potatoes, right, um, you know, also have a high um, GI and versus uh, mac macaroni, right, macaroni. Um, has a 47 and relatively lower GI compared to um, mashed potatoes, right? But they have a similar serving size, um, but they have a different content, right? A different amount of uh, carbohydrate in this particular serving, right? For example, um, 20 gram carbohydrate um, are present in the 150 gram of, of mashed potatoes and 48. Um, carbohydrate, um, you know, in the uh, macaroni. So that means the um, macaroni have a more condensed condense of a carbohydrate. Right? It contains, you know, a more um, carbohydrate in in per unit of a gram. So so you see that glycemic load actually is different. Right, um, you know, macaroni has higher 
uh, GL than the um, mashed potatoes right? because of you know, the amount of uh, carbohydrate per gram in the macaroni is higher than in the um, potatoes. So again, if the relationship between GI and GL is not straightforward, you know, the high um, GI food can have a lower GL if we eaten in a small amount, right? And or vice versa, if we have low GI food, if we can have a high GL, uh, if we eat a lot, right? Or the serving size is bigger or something like this. So it's, uh, it's really depends. So when we need to consider both GI and GL. Um, yeah, this is more information about, uh, you know, GI uh, versus GL. Um, and the, the range is also, uh, yeah, it's different. So this slide, I think I just try to give a example, you know, to uh, um, See why we need to consider both GL, I, and GL. Um, and I take more melon as an example and calculate the GL. For example, what melon GI is seven day two, right? Um, and the type of a, a carbohydrate in what melon and, and relatively simple, so they can cause a large glycemic response, right? Um, so. Um, for example, what melon has the uh, uh, six gram of a carbohydrate available, right, per serving. Um, so, and yeah, basically, I mean, and I, I think you you guys just understand, right? I just don't want to repeat. You know, they depend on the um, how complex of carbohydrate. In the, in, the, in the food, which is related to GI, and how much carbohydrate, uh, you know, how uh, in, the, in the food per gram, which is related to the GL. And other thing is that combining food, for example, if your food have also not just the carbohydrate, right, also have a protein and fat, that will also affect the uh, absorption of glucose, right, can reduce the um, uh, glycemic response. Uh, okay. All right. So these two diagrams, I just wanted to show you how um, different um, food with different GI can affect the glucose response and insulin response. We know that carbohydrate diet, the most important thing is to increase when we consume carbohydrate diet, right? The most res um, significant response to our body to the carbohydrate diet is to increase blood glucose level and increase insulin level, right? Insulin, you know, glucose and stimulate insulin level. So, um, and white bread is considered high GI food, and spaghetti is considered low GI food. So you see, they, um, compared to um, white bread, the spaghetti, when you eat spaghetti, you have a less or lower um, glycemic response, right? Um, and a lower insulin uh, response. You have a lower <coughs> insulin uh, uh, release, right? Okay, now um, let's talk about the um, diet effect on metabolism, right? The, the weight loss diet or low carbohydrate diet, sometimes it's also called Atkins diet. Have you heard about Atkins, Atkins diet, right? It's also called the ketogenic diet, meaning that you eat this type of diet for usually for two weeks and you can burn a lot of fat and generally a lot of ketone bodies, right? Um, so low-fat diet, um, what type of diet we consider low-fat diet? Usually you have the diet contains the less, less than 100 gram carbohydrate per day you eat, right? And, and this type of diet we consider low carbohydrate diet and nutrient distribution uh, in this uh, low carbohydrate diet usually uh, 
50 to 60 percent from fat and less than 30 percent from carbohydrate, right? And you can still keep to 20 to 30 percent of energy from proteins. Um, and Atkins diet or ketogenic diet usually um, have less than 50, per, 50 gram of carbohydrate, right? You eat 50, less than 50 um, gram carbohydrate per day um, and undergo like two weeks by right, ketogenic, uh, ketogenic in, induction period. Um, and you can, you can still eat proteins or fat is not limited, right? And, and no uh, sweets or no snacks for two weeks, right? Um, and the common metabolic changes you know, after two weeks of a ketogenic diet, consumption is uh, uh, ketos ketosis. I mean, you know, you produce a lot of ketone, ket ketone bodies in the body. So this is the reason why we call this a ketogenic diet, right? Now I wanted to uh, tell you how, um, the, you know, the metabolic changes and how our body generates the ketone bodies you know, when we eat this type of diet, right? Um, so this, remember, this is a low carbohydrate diet, right? We don't have a lot of carbohydrate in the diet. That means we absorb less glucose and in, in the body. So this compared to the normal diet, the, if we eat ketogenic diet and we have much lower blood glucose level, right, compared to the normal diet. So blood glucose level is lower. And what happens to the insulin compared to normal diet? Upper less insulin release, right? Because you have a lower blood glucose to stimulate insulin release. So you have lower insulin levels and higher, le higher glucagon levels. Um, and how are the other part of the body or the other tissues will change the metabolism in response to low insulin level and high glucagon levels. Let's look at the, um, I think the most significant uh, change is in the adipose tissue, right? Um, and also the liver. Um, so liver, because of uh, glucose levels low, right, and insulin levels decrease, glucagon levels increase, so that will um, see the m many metabolic pathways in the liver. Let's, let's, let's look at one by one, right? How about a glycogen breakdown or glycogen synthesis pathways in the liver when we eat low fat diet, a low carbohydrate diet? We'll go down, right? Um, we don't have enough glucose to be used for glycogen synthesis. So glycogen synthesis pathways just goes down. And what about the glycogen breakdown pathway? Will be up, right? You know, we wanted to uh, make um, glucose and release glucose into circulation um, because other tissues need glucose, right? We don't have enough from the diet, so we need to utilize the stored glycogen. So liver glycogen breakdown increase and gluconeogenesis pathway will also be increased, right, in the liver. And what about lipogenesis, fatty acid synthesis in the liver? What is the precursor to lipogenesis, substrate lipogenesis? Remember, lipogenesis, the definition of lipogenesis is to convert its surplus glucose, right, or amino acids to, to, to fat. And in the low carbohydrate diet, we don't have excess of glucose, right? We actually short of a, you know, glucose. So lipogenesis pathway will not be activated, right? Also reduced. 
um, and adipose tissue. If we don't have enough glucose from the diet, then we have to use, use we need the alternative fuels, right? So adipose tissue will break down triglyceride and the least fatty acids for energy fuel, right? For the alternative energy fuels. What a tissue use particularly for muscle. You know. um, and and glycerol also released and served as the precursor for gluconeogenesis in the in the liver. So and fatty acids released muscle and other tissue will take up for utilize as energy and liver also takes up fatty acids, right? So in the um, ketogenic diet, um, you know, the circulation fatty acids level will be increased, right? Does that make sense, right? You have, you know, you break down fatty acids, right? Try to utilize. So liver picks up fatty acids and makes ketone bodies, right? So you utilize a and then release the ketone bodies. So that's the reason why you have, uh, you know, higher levels of uh, ketone bodies into the circulation in the individuals that consume the high, uh, low carbohydrate diet or ketogenic diet. Right? Does that make sense? Right? Um, and fatty acids will, you know, or ketone bodies both actually oxidize by skeletal muscle and ketone body will also uh, utilize by brain and other tissues as well. So this is sort of the mechanism, you know, um, for a ketogenic diet and so how ketogenic diet or low carbohydrate diet affect the metabolism. Um, again, the, the, the whole process um, of pathway is that you have a low glucose levels, blood glucose levels, after consume the uh, low carbohydrate diet, and then you uh, stimulate glucagon release and, and induce less insulin, stimulate less insulin secretion. Um, so insulin, the low insulin level and high glu 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 glucagon levels will promote the, um, uh, you know, the change in metabolism in the liver and in the adipose tissue. So liver just try to make more glucose, right, and release to, um, for the other important tissue, brain and red blood cell use. Um, but in the meantime, the, fat, uh, the uh, adipose tissue and break down triglyceride and provide alternative fuels um, for, the, for the tissue use and, mean, uh, and also, you know, the high, uh, fatty acids level will promote the ketone body synthesis and you generate and uh, produce a lot of ketone bodies. All right, so here's sort of the summarize of what I described in the last diagram. You know, and after uh, consume a high, uh, the low, sorry, keep it say high, a low carbohydrate diet and you decrease the blood glucose level, decrease the insulin levels, um, and, and body utilize more glycogen, um, and gluconeogenesis will be increased to maintain circulating blood glucose level, particularly, you know, in, during the fasting condition, and lipolysis is increased, release fatty acids, and fat oxidation in liver increase, muscle increase, and um, the ketone bodies were also synthesized, right, and the, uh, from the liver. So the consequences of all of this metabolic change is to uh, lead to fat loss, right? You utilize a lot of fat, right, from, you know, the adipose tissue. So eventually you uh, lose weight after two weeks of the uh, uh, ketogenic diet. All right, uh, and something I just wanted to um, mention about the um, longevity, right? Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this book, The Blue Zones, 
Well, you there? You read? Okay, that's good. So just talking about the region in the world that the people can live uh, healthy and live uh, longer and over and the age of 100. Yes? So um, and people kind of interesting, you know, why they, they can live longer. I mean, what kind of uh, things that make them live longer. Um, so, so what they find out, actually, the, uh, the three places or regions in the world, like one actually in the United States, in Loma Lina, in California, um, and other two in Japan or Italy, Italy, uh, Italy right? Um, so, and they have a common traits that may be contributed to, you know, uh, their longevity. Um, just wanted to highlight the middle, the, actually three um, people, I mean, people in the three different regions have, this, have the same um, the common trait. Um, one is that they, they all have a family, and family is very important, right, for, for you to live healthy and longer time and no smoking um, and plant-based diet. They eat, mostly they eat plant-based diet, right? Um, and they usually have a constant, you know, modulate ac physical activities and not just uh, like, you know, uh, very, um, just to do, do like a routine uh, housework that, that keeps this kind of activity actually enough, I think. Um, and a social engagement, and, and they also eat a lot of uh, legumes, right? So this sort of, uh, um, you know, the common trait. So people interested in the um, plant-based diet, diets, this maybe is, is very important for living health. Um, so for the last, um, probably more than, uh, yeah, for last years, I think uh, the, the plant-based diet it, it became kind of very popular, right? Um, so I just wanted to um, tell you a little bit more about the plant-based diet. So basically, a vegan diet versus ADA dietary recommendations. Um, so vegan diet usually have a low fat and low glycemic index and plant-based diet. 10% um, uh, of energy from uh, in this type of di diet, 10% of energy from fat, and 15 from protein, and uh, 75 from uh, carbohydrate. And usually, it's complex carbohydrate, right? They have a lower glycemic index, the carbohydrate. Um, and it uh, contains a lot of uh, vegetables, fruits, grains, and, and legumes. Um, and if you compare to the ADA um, dietary recommendation, um, in this um, recommendation guide, um, uh, 15 to 20 percent energy from protein, less than 7 percent energy from saturated fat, and 60 to 70 percent energy from carbohydrate, usually monosaturated fat, right? So the vegan diet, I think, uh, um, yeah, contains a little bit more. Um, carbohydrate diet actually from the complex carbohydrate. Um, so, you know, for vegan diet, you um, need to avoid an animal product and fatty foods such as you know, added oils and uh, fried products, right? Um, and, and some other stuff, like nuts and seeds. Um, and favored low glycemic index. This is very important. You know, uh, you need to pick something that um, have a low glycemic index, right? The food, such as beans um, and green vegetables. And protein, energy intake, and carbohydrate intake were not limited. So I think uh, the uh, low carb carb uh, glycemic index food, you know, with the complex carbohydrate, is probably the most important um, in the uh, uh, the um, plant-based diet, right? And they did experiment uh, on the uh, uh, subjects for over 22 weeks, a study period, right? 
um, we make a comparison, the vegan diet versus ADA recommended diet, right, the two groups, they eat you know, vegan diet or ADA recommended diet. Um, after 22 weeks of study, um, you can see that the, from the uh, vegan group, the 43 percent of the um, participants that reduce their uh, di diabetic complications and versus only 26 percent of uh, subjects, you know, in the ADA group uh, and reduce the uh, diabetic com uh, complications. So you, see, you can see actually vegan diet is at the, um, the more effective, right, compared to ADA diet. And also they have a lower um, and, and their AIC by like 1.3% uh, and the ADA group only lower by 0.38%. Um, and they have a similar um, rate like reduced LDL um, by 21.6% uh, in two groups. But in the vegan group, they lost 14.3 pounds in body weight and or 88 group and only lost like 6.8 pounds, right? So just wanted to make you aware that the, you know, the plant-based diet is very efficient diet for the weight loss, right? All right, so I think uh, it's, this is the last slide for this class in this semester. So. What you learn from this class is, um, or actually, this calorie restriction, you also well known, right? And you know, it's related to longevity. I mean. So, tells we eat less, live, can live longer, and die can be medicine, right? Um, all right, so um, any questions about all the materials that we covered um, today? No? All right, um, one more thing. I, I just want to remind you again. I'm not sure that the deadline for the uh, evaluation is tomorrow or today. Tomorrow? Yes, yeah. tomorrow. Okay, so please, please, right? So do me a favor if you have not done this, right? It's very important for me, also for future students, you know, and I can see what kind of comments you give me and we'll try to improve them in the future, right? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>